Over to you, Ari. Oh, yeah. Uh, hi, everybody. Uh, I'm really excited to introduce very briefly Vernita Gordon um, and ask her to please tell us about your uh, living histories. All right, thank you. So I'm going to do this without slides because I'm at the March meeting and I feel like I have seen enough slides and I feel like anybody else who's been attending the March meeting has also seen enough slides and I it's like 8 30 on a Wednesday night and I got here Sunday evening and I, I I'm just done with slides so and I would far rather have a conversation so I know this isn't the way you normally do the living history talks I'm going to start talking I'd really rather you don't wait to the end to to ask me questions if you have a question I'd rather you just ask it in the middle and if I don't make it all the way through my story that is that is okay with me but what I really feel like is I've, I've, I've listened to myself talk enough this week and I'm gonna listen to myself talk some more tomorrow. So I would far rather have a conversation than give a talk. Is that okay? All right. Absolutely, yeah. Yeah. Okay, so I was born in Georgia, which is the state just north of Florida. If you've seen the movie Gone with the Wind, that movie is set in Georgia. I wanna be clear that movie is set a long time before I was born. Um, if you've seen the movie, My Cousin Vinny, that's also set in Georgia. That movie was set in the time I was growing up in Georgia. So I grew up in Georgia. My family, so my parents both went to college. My dad was the first in his family to go to college. His mother had finished high school. His father, my grandfather had finished second or third grade. So for him, from his family to go to college was really a very big deal. And he did it without a lot of support from his parents because they just thought this was ridiculous. He's still the only one of his siblings to go to college. And I would say half of my cousins on that side of the family have not gone to college either. On my mother's side of the family, it's more half and half. So like half of them have gone to college and half of them have not. So while in my immediate family, it was very clear that I would go to college, it wasn't really at all clear that I would go to graduate school. And it wasn't really clear that that was even a thing that wasn't really talked about as a possibility. But I grew up and I, I did well in school and I enjoyed school. And I honestly enjoyed all of my school classes. Also, by the way, Ding, the, play, the part where you moved to Paris, not knowing French is, I think the most amazing, brave thing I've ever heard. That's really great. So I grew up going to school. I really enjoyed almost all of my subjects in school. I really liked English. I liked history. I liked math. I liked science. I also did not like biology, but I think it wasn't taught very well, so maybe I would have liked it better if it had been a better class, but I didn't like it. I, I took four years of Latin, and I really enjoyed that. And I decided to major in physics when I went to college because I somehow had the idea that there were a lot of, like, things I didn't know that were still left for me to learn in physics. And I was really curious to learn those things. And I felt like, oh, well, you know, I know how to read poems and I know Latin and like, I just know these things. And now I feel like that was a very naive thing to think. But when I was 18, I just felt like, well, you know, like I know how history works. And like, so what more if I got to learn, but I felt like for physics, there's a lot to learn. That's a stupid thing to think. Okay, I just, I wanna be clear about that. Like history and English and all those things are totally legitimate disciplines that it totally makes sense to go to college to learn. That's just, I didn't realize that when I was, however old I was, 18. So I thought- So, so Barlita, sorry, yeah. since you yeah. invited us to interrupt, um, yeah. I, I wonder if with the benefit of hindsight and reflection, you would totally redesign the education system if you could to teach history and geography and nutrition and all of these things very differently. Maybe, maybe I would. I think I had some unusually good high school teachers. And one of the things that I've realized in my position as a faculty member at UT Austin is that I learned a lot of things in high school that a lot of people don't learn in high school. And so I think, and 
and I think I benefited just from some unusually good instruction from several teachers. So I think before I started trying to really change the way all these things were taught, I would try to figure out what did my teachers do that was so good? And can we extend that to more students? Because I was going to public schools in Georgia. I was not going to fancy schools and I was not in a school that, I mean, Georgia's not known for great public education, but somehow I had a really great experience in school. I don't know how to extend that and how to make sure that other people have that. Cause I thought what I had was just normal. And I'm slowly realizing that maybe it wasn't normal. And that doesn't really answer your question, but I think that would be my priority about like, how do you give other people this great experience? Wow. So with the benefit of hindsight, you actually had learned many more things that you had appreciated in the moment that you had learned. That's what you say. Yeah. I think, I think I had not realized how much I was learning. And so I knew I learned a lot in high school, but I, I thought that what I was learning in high school was just normal and everybody learned this in high school and it's a public high school in Georgia. You don't think of this as something special. I hadn't realized that a lot of people don't learn those things in high school. And I think that is something I would really like to fix, but I don't have a clue how to do it. Thank you. Like every year I realized, oh, wow, I learned this in high school and these kids have never heard of this. Like this is a gap and I wish this gap wasn't here, but I don't know how to fix it. So anyhow, so I thought growing up that I was going to go to Georgia Tech for college because Georgia Tech was in-state tuition for me. For those of you who are not from the States, college can be really expensive to go to in the States. And the way you go to college without it costing a lot of money is typically you go to a state college in your own state. I will also say that is not nearly as inexpensive now as it was when I was of college age. So when I was coming into college, state institutions were much less expensive than they are now. That, that's been a big change within my lifetime. But I thought I was going to go to Georgia Tech because they were a good school for physics and for engineering. And they were in state for me, which means they were affordable for my family. And my parents were really clear that they were not paying for private school. But then a recruiter from Vanderbilt University came to my high school and said, you should apply for the scholarship because you'd be a really good candidate. So I applied for the scholarship. Vanderbilt is a very expensive school, but I applied for the scholarship and I got a very, very generous scholarship deal from them where they paid for all my tuition plus a lot of other things. So it actually wound up being less expensive for me to go to Vanderbilt for college than it would have been for me to go to Georgia Tech for college, even though Vanderbilt is this expensive private university and Georgia Tech was a public institution. So because it was less expensive to go to Vanderbilt and because I really liked it much better than Georgia Tech when I visited, I went to Vanderbilt. And I think that was a real turning point for me in terms of having an opportunity to really see what it meant to be a scientist and to get involved with that and to kind of start thinking about science as a career and something I could, I could go to graduate school with and what that might look like. And just the opportunity in a, in a small kind of nurturing college environment to get to know other professors or get to know graduate students well. I don't know that I would have become a scientist if I had gone to Georgia Tech. I think if I had gone to Georgia Tech, I would have gotten a good education, but I probably would have stopped with a bachelor's degree and gone off and got a job and probably not stayed in science if I had to guess. But from Vanderbilt, I wound up going to Harvard for grad school. I made the decision to go to grad school in the worst way possible. No one should ever make a grad school decision the way I did because I went to grad school essentially because I didn't know what to do next. I wanted to have some kind of income. I knew that I would get paid a stipend if I went to grad school. So I went to grad school and I picked Harvard out of my graduate school opportunities because I really had no clue what type of science I wanted to do but Harvard seemed like it had the most choices. And so I thought, well, this will keep all my options open. But it turns out if you really don't know what you want to do, keeping all your options open is not, it's not beneficial. It just sort of leaves you in a state of paralysis. 
So I went to grad school. I found the first year graduate coursework really, really, really difficult because most of my classmates had come from institutions that offered a lot more in the way of undergraduate education than I had had at Vanderbilt. So at Vanderbilt, I took all the undergraduate stuff I could, and I even took a little bit of graduate stuff. But these other places, like people who had gone to Princeton and MIT, or even places like Purdue, had just had a lot more undergraduate foundation laid for them. So when they got to graduate school, the courses were taught in such a way to challenge them and meet them where they were starting. And I just felt like I was drowning that entire year. Like I, I was just thinking, I cannot do this. This is super hard. I have no idea what anybody's talking about. And it was a really, really, really difficult year for me. Then I joined a group. And without going into too much detail, the research group I was in was a really negative environment. It was not a biophysics research group. I want to be super clear about this because I didn't know what I wanted. But I joined a group. It was a really bad environment for me. I didn't dare to leave the group because I had felt so beat down by the end of my first year coursework that I felt like if I leave this group, no one will ever take me. I will have no future. And so I tried to stick it out. And that was also a really poor decision because it just kept getting worse. Like it wasn't something where you can, it just didn't get better. And so finally, after four years of this kind of very hurtful environment, I got fired at the end of my fourth year of graduate school. This is with four first author papers. So I had four first author papers and I got fired and I was like, well, I'm going to leave graduate school and go run a gas station in Alabama because I was done. Like I just wanted to be completely done with this. But I went to a professor at Harvard and I said, look, I just wanna finish my PhD. I hate science. You have to spend all your time by yourself. People are mean to you. Like, I don't wanna do this anymore, but I've put in this much time. I just wanna finish my PhD. Can I please just finish my PhD and then I'm gonna leave and you'll never see me again. And he was like, well, in my group, there's a lot of people. You don't have to spend all your time by yourself. And in my group, if people are mean to you, I will do something about it. And I was like, well, that's a novel approach. And so I switched into this new group and it took probably a year for me to like emotionally recover from the experience I had had in my first group. But after like a year, I kind of realized that I really liked the people I was working with. No one was being mean to me. I was working with some really great people that I enjoyed being with. I was, I was doing work that was engaging and meaningful for me. And I was kind of good at it. Like I had the ability to kind of bring my own creativity and my own self to the work. And so discovering that I actually enjoyed doing science was kind of a big surprise to me at this point. I didn't expect to like it. I was just like, I will stick it out for two more years because I'm really good at sticking things out. I'll get this degree and I'll, you know, I'll be done. But once I realized that I enjoyed this, I had to really reevaluate where I was going to go after graduate school. So I wound up doing a postdoc. And then because I had spent such a short time in this new field of physics, I was going to do a second postdoc. And when I was trying to figure out what to do for a second postdoc, I did a lot of really deep introspection. And like Ding, I didn't want to do biology. Biology was too messy and you had to memorize all these things and there were all these proteins and they all had different names and there were all these genes and they all had different names. And I just didn't want to, like, I didn't want to deal with it. So I started trying to figure out like what I did want to do. And I was looking at a lot of possibilities and the only possibilities I could get excited about were people who were doing biology. And I got really mad at myself because I was like, I, I don't want to do biology. Like I need to find, and so I tried to make myself get excited about non-biophysics work. And I wanna be clear, like the people I was trying to get excited about, they were perfectly good scientists doing perfectly good work. I just could not get excited about it. And finally I said, well, if I can't get excited about anything that's not biology, I probably should pay attention to that because you probably shouldn't go do a postdoc if you're not excited to do it. And I also 
in this period of kind of deep introspection I was doing, I realized that I really needed to be able to see how the work I was doing as a scientist was going to be able to make other people's lives better. And I want to be clear, I think all of us, I think all human beings need to be doing things to make other people's lives better. I don't think that as scientists, that has to be what we do as a scientist. I think you can do pure science research that has nothing to do with making people's lives better, and you can make people's lives better in, in other parts of your life. And I think that's fine. I think that's totally valid. But for me, that didn't work. For me, like, I just could not personally resonate with, like, how hard I was working and how much of myself I was throwing into research unless I could say, this will benefit other people one day. So for me, that was super important in choosing a direction to go. So I did a second postdoc and then I came to UT Austin. I was on the faculty market in the year that the economy crashed in 2008, 2009. That was also a stressful time and not the most fun time to be looking. So I came to UT Austin, I guess I started there in 2010. I deferred for a year after I accepted their offer so that my husband could finish his PhD at University of Illinois and we could move together. And we came to UT Austin. Three months after I came to UT Austin, I got pregnant. This was on purpose. I on purpose got pregnant. So I had a baby after I'd been at UT for slightly less than a year. And because I was, sorry, I need to back up. I was 35 when I started the job at UT Austin. So I had a baby when I was 36. So I was just like, you know, politically, this may not be the best time to have a baby, but I'm 35. So we're just doing this. Like, I can't, I can't argue about politics right now. And then when that baby was a year old, I got sec pregnant a second time, again, also by plan, because I was like, I'm 37 now, <laughs> we just need to do this. So I had a second baby. I had, so I had two babies in my first three years at UT Austin. This isn't something that has been super common in this department. It's not been a department where there's been a lot of women having babies. I was apprehensive about how this would be perceived there. I never had anyone say anything negative to me about this. Everyone was either supportive or, you know, they didn't say anything, but they didn't like not say anything in a bad way. So that was actually, I think, a really pleasant surprise for me at how just supportive and understanding people were about like, oh, hey, look, there's a pregnant woman in the elevator. We're not used to that, but okay, I guess that's cool. Like, so that was really good. And then I got tenure. Sorry, there was some other stuff that happened in there, but then I got tenure and I got tenure, I guess in 2018. So that was a few years ago. We have gone through a pandemic. I am glad the pandemic is getting better and I don't really have a great conclusion, but this is where I am. Like, I mean, I feel like I can't conclude this if it's a living history, because like my life isn't over yet, but this is where I've gotten to. All right, thank you so much. Um, that was incredibly powerful. Um, thank you for sharing your story. Um, does anybody have any questions for Runita? Um, I just I want to start. Oh, go, ahead. go ahead. I just want to resonate with what Arit just said and say, wow, thank you. That was so powerful. Yeah. Oh, thanks for asking me to do it. Yeah. Yeah, I, I just wanted to echo that. And I'm you know, so sorry about the graduate school experience that you were describing. Um, I, I had a postdoc experience like that. And it was only two years instead of four, but it was, uh, you know. See, like, those four years were bad, but I also, like, I want to be fair. Mm -hmm. Experience with my second advisor was great. Uh, right, ex yeah, great exactly. Um, exactly. But I mean, but to have those years of just, I mean, no, nobody should be treated that way. Um, yeah. Yeah, thank you. And I'm sorry for your experience. Yeah, yeah. I mean, and my, my second postdoc was like your second advisor. It's like, oh my God, people actually aren't assholes it's amazing you know yeah um do, do you feel that that's informed how you act as an advisor to your own students i certainly try for it mm -hmm. i don't think i'm a perfect advisor i mean but, 
I try to be really aware of the fact that I am imperfect. Mm -hmm. And I try to make sure that my students know that it's okay to go get help from people who aren't me if that's something they need to do. Yeah. Yeah. If I could ask a question, uh, uh, Doctor, um, how much of the support you found that was positive came from within your department mm -hmm. versus from your advisor and group? versus outside of the department in the university versus the community or other connections. Are you talking about in grad school? Or are you talking about as a faculty job or like? Well, either, any, just kind of um, interested in what you think about it. So I think in grad school, the biggest support overall that I got was from my advisor and from the other people within that research group. But I think there were also significant key supports that happened at very important times from people within the department. And I think there was also a very important kind of baseline emotional level of support or social level of support from people outside the university, just in the community more broadly. Thank you. Um, Rita, I have a question. Um, so it, um, when you started the story, you um, mentioned that um, there were um, a few people in your family who went to uh, to get higher education, but um, uh, not on the on the graduate level. Um, and um, this is uh, something I, I also um, it resonates with me because I'm also um, one of the only people in my family um, who did this and. Um, I wonder if you have any advice for people who are kind of like, you know, first generation in their family navigating through the academic system. Uh, I feel like maybe people who have their family to rely on get this additional level of support that is very nice and helpful, but other people need to find different ways to get this information. And uh... I, I think you're really right. So I don't know how to do this, but I think you're super right that if you're the first person in your family to go on to a graduate degree, it is very different from if your whole, you know, if you have parents or like other people who've done graduate work and like they can kind of help you navigate it. And I, I definitely saw that difference that there were people in my entering class who were just far more clued in about how things work because they had that family background to make it very natural for them. Like, of course they were clued in. I've sometimes wondered, like, there's there's more awareness now than there used to be of supporting first generation college students, and and I I agree, like we do need to support first generation college students, but I sometimes think that maybe we should also think about supporting first generation graduate students, or giving more kind of directed advising to all our graduate students, so that we don't kind of just assume that there's all these things in the culture they'll, they'll just know. Because I think that's the kind of thing that causes people to slip through the cracks. Right. I had this ambition one time that I was going to like start a mentoring program for first generation graduate students. And then I was just like, I, I can't do more things. And I still kind of feel <laughs> like I can't do more things, but I still think that would be a good idea. Um, all right. Can I take a moment to jump in? And Please. Okay. So, so I just want to, again, echo what Arit asked and what you said and uh, ask again, uh, combining with your comment about we all have an obligation to make the world better. Um, how do you transfer intergenerational wealth, whether it's real wealth or social wealth or this body of knowledge that some people have and some people don't about how things work? Um, like what advice do you give young people about how to transfer intergenerational wealth in a more equitable way? I don't think I give young people advice on how to transfer intergenerational wealth. I don't think I've done that. I have tried to do things like when I teach introductory physics classes, I try to have a day in class where I take some time to talk about graduate school and I make sure to tell them things like you will get paid to go to graduate school. Like, cause there's always people who worry that they won't be able to afford it. They can't take out more loans. And so I 
make sure to talk about that. I make sure to talk about this is why you should go to office hours and get to know your professors and just things like that, that I think are important for people to know. But that's more me trying to pass on my knowledge. It's not me trying to teach other people how to pass on their knowledge. And I guess I feel like the people that I'm in a position of mentoring are in a young enough stage of their career. I don't know that I want to tell them you need to be passing on your knowledge so much as I want to be nurturing them up to be in a good position later on. Thank you so much. Yeah. All right. Uh, thank you, Vernita. Uh, let's thank Vernita again, everybody. Um, that was great. And um, just would love to continue this conversation, but given the time, we should probably move on to our next and last, but not least, speaker. <laughs>